Um, I'm Jonathan Warmerdam. I work for the North Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board. I'm a senior environmental scientist specialist. And my partner, Jennifer Kara, is a freshwater ecologist with the Nature Conservancy. Today we'll be uh, presenting, as Jim said, on the Garcia River, um, a bit of an overview um, of some of the work we've been working on together out there for over a decade now. Nice to be back. It, it hasn't been a couple of years. Last last time I was here, actually, was just presented an overview of this. Um, we we didn't have the data quite ready to um, be providing to the audience, so it's exciting to be here for that. A um, couple topics we'll be covering. Um, I'll be going over just an overview, um, give some context for the watershed, um, its history, its impairment. Um, I'll be talking about some of the recovery actions that have been implemented over the, the last couple decades, um, especially more recently, um, to try and recover some of the, uh, the impaired uh, condition. Then I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer. She'll be discussing the Garcia River Monitoring Program and some of the data and trends, and then I'll be wrapping up with some conclusions. Um, to give you a little bit of context, the Garcia is uh, located in southwest Mendocino County. It's uh, approximately 73,000 acres, about 115 square miles. It's uh, bordered on the, the west side by Point Arena, a little coastal town, and then on the uh, northeast side by the town of Boonville, where Boone Amber Ale comes from. Anybody have that? Good, good stuff. Um, the, uh, just to show you on the map, up here where Mill Creek and uh, part of Low Creek come together is where the main stem starts. I kind of want to orient you because we'll be discussing uh, the watershed um, in depth a little bit further. As you come down, you pass some of the key major tributaries, Lamore Creek and Blue Water Creek. I'm going to focus on an area right here later on. I want to... I want to point it out now, This it looks kind of like a face profile. Keep that in mind as we pass Inman Creek and Signal Creek and down to the South Fork um, of the Garcia. This is where the Garcia intercepts the San Andreas Fault and uh, takes a sharp turn and it heads northwest up until um, it, it finally takes a jog to the left and makes it up to the coast. The San Andreas actually leaves, leaves the coast right here up in Manchester. So. Um, a couple things to um, think about the uh, geology of the watershed. Everything to the east of the San Andreas is coastal belt Franciscan. Everything to the west um, is marine um, uplifted terrace deposits. It's all really highly erodible um, soils that are um, subject to uh, erosion when you focus water on them or disturb them with equipment. Um, uh, it's also uh, subject to mass uh, wasting, landsliding, and, and so it's an inherently unstable area. Um, and the Garcia itself is impaired due to sediment and temperature on the 303D list of the Clean Water Act. Um, up in the upper part of the, the watershed, you have a mix of, of grasslands and oak woodlands. Um, as you move down farther, we have a, um, kind of our conifer forests, redwoods, uh, dug fir, uh, some other uh, sub, uh, dom not dominant, subdominant um, species. Uh, but pretty much the merchantable timber is our redwood and Douglas fir. Down in the very bottom, um, then you start mixing in some riparian um, streamside. Uh, alders and willows and things interspersed with that conifer forest. And there's 12 different sub-watersheds in the Garcia. They range in size from about 2,000 to 5,000 um, acres. Um, and uh, within those, we have all sorts of different aquatic organisms. Um, I haven't featured any bugs on this, so I apologize. These are all <laughs> aquatic vertebrates. We have a uh, yellow-legged frog at the top, western brook lamprey. And these are all species that we um, have taken photos up in the Garcia, a um, couple different types of salamanders, western pond turtle, etc. But the primary reason um, why we're here today is uh, really there's been a big focus on the declining anadromous salmonids that are native to this watershed. Up in the top right, we have um, a Chinook salmon, um, also known as a king salmon, and that is a federally uh, listed as threatened um, species under the Endangered Species Act. On the bottom left, we have um, coho salmon, um, also known as silver salmon. These are critically endangered, um, both state and federally listed. Um, and then the bottom right is steelhead um, trout. And uh, just to give you a sense of kind of where we are, coho salmon in particular are, are pretty much our most um, endangered of our, our native anadromous salmonids. The, the numbers in the southern range of their um, population 
vary sometimes to as low as a couple thousand, um, maybe sometimes dipping even under that. Um, and that, that extends from Humboldt County all the way down to the Monterey area. Um, and under the recovery plan for coho salmon in this range, the Garcias listed is um, ideally having at least 3,000. So just to give you kind of a sense of how bad things are. Um, so the reason why um, is kind of a long, long story, but um, it, it starts really um, back shortly after California became the 31st state in 1850. The Garcia um, started seeing its first wave of industrial uh, timber logging. This was, this was an uh, early era. It was really primitive, and this is a mill that's located on the uh, right next to the North Fork of the Garcia, uh, about seven miles up from the ocean. And this was a period of, um, you know, primitive harvesting techniques. People using axes and um, hand saws. Um, there wasn't heavy equipment on the site yet. Um, they were using oxen team to drag wood down to the rivers, um, and then eventually there was an advancement of um, what's called the steam donkey. This is kind of a precursor to our modern cable yarding equipment. Um, once the trees were brought to the to the rivers, and the rivers were actually used to transport this wood down to these mills. So this is a, a splash dam that was constructed. Um, you can see the men on the side of it. During the summer, these dams would be erected, and then during the winter, uh, or the fall freshets, like the storm that just came through, these would be plugged up and water would raise up behind them. All the trees that had been felled in there would be moved towards the dam and then catastrophically these would be just let to flush down the system. So you'd have a series of these all at once going. Um, and that happened for decades in the Garcia. That was a, that was a pretty destructive period. Um, here's, a, here's an image of one of those I'm actually being triggered um, in some of the big drives getting down to the mill. So during that period too, these, any obstructions in the way had to be removed because you had to, you had to move, that, move that wood down to that mill. Um, that mill that I featured earlier, um, there was a flume that extended from there that ex went all the way down to the coast. Um, uh, primarily it was railroad ties during that era. Um, there was a seven mile flume that, that went down there and then those were shipped off um, at Point Arena down to primarily the um, San Francisco Bay. Things really changed though. I mean, that sounds like a bad period, but things really got worse um, during the 1940s and 1970s. This is the um, post-World War II economic expansion. This was known as the golden era of capitalism. Um, in 1940s, uh, the population of California was about 7 million people. By the 1970s, we were up at 20 million people. And with that, we had the suburbanization of, of California where a lot of new housing was developed, so you needed a lot of material to um, build those houses. Um, but there weren't any uh, environmental protection rules in place at that time. There was no Endangered Species Act, no Clean Water Act, no Forest Practice Act, and it was kind of the heyday of just liquidation logging. Um, these photos show, uh, you know, the use of um, this middle photo is um, Signal Creek. Um, where basically roads were built right up the guts of these, these main, uh, main tributaries. Um, and every year, a lot of erosion would just wash into these, they'd blow out these roads, they'd rebuild them again, and this went on for decades. Um, this is really when the impairment of the Garcia took place, and this was 60-something years ago. Um, all the debris was tossed into the channels and kind of left to, to wash out if possible, and there's a lot of waste wood and, and different products. Here's a, um, an image of, uh, of, of a large bridge being put in, um, it, which led to a site called the Mill D site. Um, this was the, a large occupied area. Um, in the, the, the middle part of the watershed. I point out this, with, it's called a TP burner right here. They're loading up slash into here. I'm gonna get back to this in a minute, but I want, to keep, I want you to keep that in mind. Um, give you a sense of what the harvest looked like at that time. This is a, um, a, a graph showing uh, from 1945 to 2010 in four north coast uh, uh, counties what the total amount of wood was that was being removed. Um, and up here in 1955 was uh, 2.8 billion board feet. And a board foot is a one foot by one foot by one inch piece of wood. So 2.8 billion was the highest down to right after the Great Recession 
and we were down at around 170 million board feet. And what drove this in particular was a taxation system that California had in place called the ad valorem uh, timber property tax. Ad valorem in, in Latin means according to value. And if anybody here owns a home right now, um, you would know that every year you pay taxes on your uh, property based on the value of the property and the value of the structure, um, the house that is. Back in this period, you were also taxed based on the value of your standing timber. So California had a system in place where you were taxed unless you liquidated 70% of your timber, you were taxed on the value of that every year. And this really drove that, ex you know, that expansion, that suburbanization, um, but it forced a lot of the liquidation and a lot of the problems that we're still dealing with these days. So I, I think that's a really interesting point um, in our history. That was finally replaced in the, in the mid uh, 1970s with what's called the sustained yield tax. This is when the Forest Practice Rules and Forest Practice Act were initiated. Um, that transitioned it away from the, the annual taxation to when you sent wood to the mill, that was um, actually what was taxed. You can see a, a pretty significant decline in harvest rates right when that happened. We did see a bump later on again. Um, I'll get to that in a second, but just to give you a visual, this is 1952 aerial photograph. Again, remember I, I pointed out that kind of uh, profile looking face. So this is basically untouched. There's really no evidence that I can see in here um, of any roads, any structures or anything. This is old growth virgin forest not that long ago. Um, and then I want to go to 1963. And you can see how much um, encroachment has taken place. These are All these white lines are major logging roads, um, skid trails, um, you have landslides going into the main main stem. So this is main stem here, and then point out right here. Here's that Mill D site, and there's that teepee burner. You can actually see the smoke rising off of it. Pretty incredible, especially because there was no rules in place, and so every stream channel was used to just drag wood out, get it to the mill, and that's what we're that's what we're still recovering with, recovering from. Excuse me. Um, Interestingly, I found a survey that was done by the California Department of Fish and Game in 1966. They, they looked at four different watersheds in California, um, the McQualamy River, Battle Creek, Redwood Creek, and the Garcia to kind of get a representative sample of how did things look right now. They knew that there was this liquidation going on across all those. And so um, I, I added some color to this just to um, show ultimately most of the watershed was was um, impacted. Um, I'd, I'd rather just point out the blue areas. These are areas that were basically untouched. So the majority of this watershed at that point was um, having some se severe implications from all this logging. Um, there's other land use impacts that have occurred since that era. Um, we had renewed logging, like I mentioned, between the 80s and 90s. There was approximately 43% of the watershed was harvested again, a lot of the second growth. Um, there's been agricultural activities um, for a really long time, but it's really just focused in the very bottom part of the watershed. I forgot to mention that the population in the Garcia is maybe 200 to 300 people. It's not very much. It's, it's just a forested watershed primarily, but that ag zone is really mainly in the bottom. There's gravel mining that occurred for a couple decades, and then we've had periods of um, cannabis cultivation. Some of it is just people growing on their own property, but then we've had a lot of trespass grow issues also um, over the last decade. Um, cumulative effects from all of this, we have the graded stream channels, simplified aquatic habitats, a lot of fine set, uh, substrate, uh, increased turbidity, um, decreased large wood um, woody debris volumes actually occurred because there was a systematic kind of clearing of um, what were these very choked systems with excess wood. There was a, a period where we had to, we went in and kind of cleared things out thinking, you know, we need to flush the system and we had fish barriers and all sorts of other problems that were occurring. And so now we, now we have actually a, a decreased volume of wood. Um, our riparian forests are really young. Um, you know, these could have been 500 to 1,000 year old trees that would have been adjacent to the river, and right now we're dealing with 50 to 75 year old um, trees. So, 
lot of problems, um, but primarily, you know, we're, we're talking about degraded biology is, is one of the big things that we're focused on. So what types of actions are being made um, at this point to try and improve things and alter that? Um, so that gets us into my section, second portion on the TMDL um, implementation and recovery plan. So there's a long list of different recovery um, and uh, restoration actions that have been taking place over um, the decades. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, um, but a couple that I wanted to point out. Um, the Forest Practice Rules and Forest Practice Act is a huge one. Um, you know, that, Having that come on in the 1970s was a big game changer. No longer were we running tractors down the middle of stream channels. Suddenly we had buffer zones. We didn't have this liquidation taxation program. And that was a really significant one, and it's continued to improve. Um, the Garcia TMDL Action Plan, which I'm going to touch on in a moment, um, and then the acquisition of the Garcia River Forest property, which um, was done in 2004 by the Conservation Fund, the Nature Conservancy, the State Coastal Commission, and the Wildlife Conservation purchased this former industrial piece of land. It's the largest piece of land um, in, the, in the watershed, and Jennifer will touch on that a little bit later. Um, so the Garcia River watershed sediment total maximum daily load. A TMDL is essentially a sediment budget. Um, it recognizes what, what are the amounts of um, a pollutant that are coming into a water body, um, and at what point, if you reduce it, will that aid in the um, recovery of whatever impaired beneficial use or biology that you're trying to, to um, improve. So it was adopted into the North Coast um, Basin Plan in 2002 and became state law. Um, that's been my job for the last uh, 12 years, this implementation of this program. Um, it was the first sediment TMDL in history to have an implementation strategy and it actually got, um, the EPA got sued over this um, whether they had the authority under the Clean Water Act to implement a program for non-point source pollution. Um, traditionally, the 303D Act was focused more on point sources of pollution, and the, the authority was upheld, um, and the state developed an implementation strategy to try and uh, uh, go forward with the TMDL. And the goal of it, ultimately, is just to reduce the amount of anthropogenic and controllable sediment delivery sources. There's three compliance options. Um, first one's a default option. It applies to everybody. This is kind of deeper in the weeds. But ultimately, I wanted to point out that um, landowners are expected to develop erosion control plans to address their um, sediment delivery sites from their roads or logging activities, um, et cetera and um, adhere to a series of best management practices to prevent the creation of new sources. At this point, we're um, currently working with about 80% of the watershed. Um, they're somewhere in that process of um, implementing ECPs, erosion control plans, um, adhering to best management practices. Um, and this map kind of shows the coverage overall. And that results in, uh, we've had uh, over 300 miles of road have been upgraded. 1,800 sediment delivery sites treated, 250,000 cubic yards of episodic erosion saved. So that's, uh, that's sources that potentially could um, deliver kind of catastrophically from like a stream crossing blowing out or a landslide, et cetera. Um, 65,000 cubic yards of chronic erosion. So this is kind of your phantom sediment sources that come off of roads that are hydrologically connected to streams. Um, there's always kind of a continuum of sediment moving into the system. So by disconnecting those, you're, you're arresting a lot of that. Um, to give you a little bit of a sense of what that might look like, and that equates to approximately 1,275 uh, dump truck loads of sediment per year that is being prevented from going into the the watershed. And that's about 100 per sub-watershed. And over the life of the TMDL, that's about 50,000 of those dump truck loads if they each held 10 cubic yards. Um, 
there's been other restoration actions that have been taking place over the decade, over the last couple of decades. But in particular, I want to highlight and um, give a plug to something that um, I'm, I think is a great restoration technique. And um, partners at TNC and the Conservation Fund and MRC and um, Trout Unlimited have been implementing. This is called accelerated wood recruitment. This is um, basically going into the sub watersheds and finding areas where you have sufficient riparian canopy where you can do directional falling of streamside trees um, or bringing in heavy equipment and wedging these, um, trying to reestablish a wood component for the um, benefit of the, the salmonids that, that evolved with that being a natural part of their, um, their system. It provides refugia for them during the winter flows. It scours pools. It sorts sediment. It has all these different benefits. Um, I want to point out this this is a, a spot on the South Fork that was treated in 2014, and this is a, a panoramic um, view. Um, you have a couple trees that were put in over here off, off this right bank. There's a tree right under us that um, I want you to pay attention to for a moment. Um, I'll get back to that, and then a couple up here. So. Um, I, I thought it would be interesting to look at some of our monitoring data um, just to see what it kind of what effect some of um, this large wood recruitment has on 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 this reach. And so I isolated this. This is a, um, a 60 meter section um, of of this reach. Um, basically, it starts down at the bottom and um, ends up at the top. And um, this this shows depths of um, the water depth, so zero to 70 um, as you move up. These are Thalweg measurements that are taken every two meters. And in 2009, um, you know, it was primarily just uh, riffle, glide, habitat, nothing fancy. Um, 2012, uh, looking at it, nothing really changed. Um, 2014, it was about the same. You know, still everything's about 30, uh, 30 centimeters deep. Um, but that summer, 2014, was when this wood recruitment was done. And then um, if you look at it in 2015, immediately you have a pretty significant increase in pool habitat and um, complexity, um, which is really good. Fish really appreciate that as well as other organisms. Um, to give, give you another view of that, here's that tree um, that we were, we were looking down on. Um, another way to um, kind of assess what the, the results of these are is to go underwater. And this is a video I took last year. Um, and down in the bottom, um, there you have a, a nice little school. of It's mixed. It's primarily coho salmon with the long par marks, but then in the little the bottom, there's a couple steelhead, and they're eating a crayfish. I thought that was kind of cool. <laughs> Just happened to be uh, right then. I love that. I love that video. Um, so, uh, are the conditions, uh, the physical, chemical, uh, biological of the Garcia River watershed improving? I'm going to turn it over now to Jennifer, and, and she'll take it from there. monitoring program that we put in place to, to evaluate recovery of the watershed. So there were a couple of objectives for this monitoring program. The first was the Water Board, you know, obviously had made really significant investments in implementation of the TMDL, and they wanted to track progress towards meeting specific numeric targets and goals that they had set for the TMDL uh, with regard to sediment and temperature and a number of other variables they were looking at. Jonathan mentioned that about a third of the watershed was purchased um, for conservation in 2004 in partnership with a number of conservation groups and state agencies. That uh, project is called the Garcia River Forest. It represents about a third of the watershed, and there were a couple of management goals for that project. Um, one was to uh, restore and recover a healthy redwood forest that could both provide biodiversity protection and help 
aid in salmonid recovery specifically, and also be operated for sustainable forestry. Um, and so to, we had specific kind of numeric goals and targets, management goals that we wanted to track um, associated with that project as well. And since, um, you know, a, a monitoring program is going to be a significant investment, and it was certainly in this case, it made sense for us to collaborate and really work on this together. So we started doing this, kind of thinking about it in 2006, and actually started implementation in 2007. And so we were looking for uh, kind of off-the-shelf um, monitoring protocol that we could use to assess a number of um, specific uh, variables that we were interested in looking at related to forest condition, riparian condition, sediment transport, et cetera. And so we picked um, the EPA's uh, EMAP protocol and um, worked with the Western Ecology Division on training and implementation on that. And as I think probably most of you know, um, SWAMP is derived from EMAP, um, and NARS now is, is also derived from EMAP um, at the EPA level. So a couple of really big advantages, you know, off-the-shelf protocol, standardized methods, um, and it provides a really large amount of information on physical and biological and chemical conditions that we were interested in. Another huge advantage is it's a probabilistic survey design, so we could, you know, sample a relatively small number of sites and make inference to the whole watershed, which was important to us. Um, and it was also important that we um, generate information that would help assess the TMDL numeric targets. And um, you can see those listed on the left there. It provides information on all those things as well as a whole set of other stuff that we were interested in tracking um, as well. So I'm going to kind of frame this in terms of, you know, what, what does it look like to the fish? Jonathan mentioned that that's one of the primary beneficial uses and, and targets that we were trying to aid recovery in, in this watershed. So um, when I'm presenting the information, the first slide will always be kind of what does it mean from a Salmonid's perspective, our friend, the coho here. Um, so, you know, are we seeing things that they'd want to see, like deepening stream channels, for example, more complex ha habitat, coarsening of substrates, um, increases in large wood volumes, recovering riparian forests, etc. So, um, the, we started data collection, as I mentioned, in 2007. And between 2007 and 2010, we established 80 um, monitoring reaches in the watershed. Uh, EMAP reaches are, they are at a minimum 150 meters long, and they could go up to 800 meters in length. Um, and uh, we have, we did um, complete sampling of 65 reaches in um, between in 2007 and 8, and then again in 2012. So I'm going to present baseline information that's a combination of the 2007 and 8 data, and then also some trend analysis looking at whether or not we could detect changes between those sampling periods between 2008 and 2012, essentially. So the work was um, was done in combination with the Water Board. TNC uh, hired full-time summer field crews both in 2008 and 2012 that did the sampling for the bulk of the sites. And then the Water Board had a crew that conducted annual surveys during that time frame and then also in between so we could look at between year variability as well. Um, and incidentally, this, it wasn't inexpensive to do. Um, we so the, the kind of rough cost to break down for the work that the, the Nature Conservancy has done so far with the two full time full time crews plus my time for data analysis and management of the crews and that sort of thing. We're talking about probably around four hundred fifty thousand dollars. And for the Water Board's investment to date, um, that's for their annual field crew. It's, it's been around two hundred fifty thousand dollars. So, um, you know, it's a significant investment, but we feel like it's an investment well made. There are very few places where this level of information is collected, and there are a lot of very similar watersheds on the North Coast that are dealing with similar recovery issues. We feel like this is um, a good place to make that investment and kind of look at some of these variables and changes um, and assessment of recovery actions uh, in this watershed, and it, that things we learn here will have implications uh, at a much larger scale. So I'm going to present the information in three categories, essentially. So for each of the variables, we sort of split out 
um, the data into in the Garcia main stem sites. So these are on, on the main stem of the river. They're generally very low gradient sites. They're all less than 3% gradient, and a lot of them are closer to 1. Um, and then two tributary categories, one that are equal to or less than 3% in slope, and high gradient tributaries, which are greater than 3% slope. Um, the data will be presented in green if it's dealing with um, achievement of a numeric target that was set. And um, where we're doing trend analyses, positive changes will be noted in blue and negative in yellow. So um, the first thing that we found is that the tributary streams really appear to be getting deeper, which is a good thing, um, more complex, which is also a good thing, and providing better rearing habitat for juvenile salmonids. So um, we saw, in looking at the trend data, we saw significant increases in thawweg depths um, in high gradient tributaries, and um, we saw significant uh, increases in standard deviation of thawweg depth, so the amount of complexity in, in thawweg depth that was present in low gradient tributaries where we'd expect some to be rearing, which is a, is a good thing. Um, and not quite significant, but we did see um, increases in thawweg depths in low gradient tributaries and in residual depths, so flow independent depths in low gradient tributaries. Substrate composition in the tributaries has recovered to a degree, um, and but continues to fluctuate some. And the main stem reaches are still impaired um, as far as fine sediment goes. Again, these are the lowest gradient areas in the watershed, um, and still have pretty high fine sediment loads. So what does that look like? You can see the D50 results here, um, much larger particle sizes in the higher gradient tributaries, no surprise, than in the main stem. Um, when we look at percent sand and fine specifically in the, um, the tributaries, both the high and low gradient tributaries, what we see is that they um, meet the biologically numeric targets for macroinvertebrates and aquatic vertebrates that were set by Sandra Bryce and her colleagues in 2010. Um, so looking pretty good. This is particles that are two millimeters in size or smaller. Um, so looking pretty good for both fish and bugs with fine sediment um, distribution in the tributaries. However, the main stem exceeds those targets set by Sandra Bryce and colleagues um, by a bit at 15.4%. different sediment size categories. So if we go up to a slightly larger category, which is 16 millimeters and smaller, so this would include some fine gravels, as well as the sand and fines, we did see an increase in our high gradient tributaries during between 2008 and 2012, um, and, and relatedly a decrease in the, the geometric mean substrate diameter in those same locations. Um, we were interested in looking at, you know, there's been really big investments in sediment source um, treatment in a lot of these same areas during our, between our different sampling periods. So folks um, getting grant monies to actually go out and remove culverts, um, remove roads, upgrade roads, uh, et cetera, and wondering if there was some kind of maybe temporary pulse of fine sediment that was getting into the system, the upper part of the watershed due to this restoration activity. So we looked at that um, and the test was inconclusive. It, it, there was a positive trend, but it wasn't significant. We did have a relatively small sample size, though there were only, I think, 12 of our 25 sites that I looked at for high gradient tributaries that had been treated. Uh, we also looked at relative bed stability, which is essentially, um, it's just uh, uh, the observed mean particle size over the uh, ratio of the observed mean particle size over the critical diameter, which is the largest particle that could be moved at a bank full flow. Um, so that's essentially a measure of kind of the interplay of sediment supply and transport. You'd expect to see positive values um, or highly positive values if you've got like an armored channel or low sediment supply situation where you might be below a dam or something. Um, and then negative values if you've got a lot of movable substrate. So that's either indicating you've got excess sediment supply or, or something along those lines. Um, and there were ideal RBS values that were set by Kaufman and colleagues in um, their Jawa paper in 
2009. So we set preferred ranges for, for a number of different western stream types, including the coast range, um, and we're comparing to those values here. And you can see that the low gradient tributaries um, and the um, high gradient tributaries, as well as the Garcia um, main stem, all met the preferred range for, for bed stability. Um, we did see some changes between 2008 and 2012. In the low gradient tributaries, we had a, a slight decrease, um, although they continued to meet the preferred range for RBS values. Um, high gradient tributaries decreased and shifted the RBS scores slightly to the upper end of the fair range, but um, they're right up at the top still. So one of the things that we found is that large wood and in-stream channel cover is still really lacking in the watershed, despite the restoration actions that have been taking place. Um, but that the restoration actions in the, the specific reaches that were treated are increasing volume and habitat both. So when we looked at trends, we saw an increase in large wood volume in the Garcia main stem during uh, between 2008 and 2012 and at the same time a decrease in large wood volumes in the tribs. So transport of large wood happening from the tribs to the main stem during this period. Um, we also saw a decrease in um, smaller wood and brush um, in the high gradient tribs. So significant transport happening. Um, we wanted to look at, you know, Jonathan mentioned that a fair amount of large wood augmentation has been done in the watershed. There's, I think, over 10 miles of streams that have been treated. Um, and most of that work was done between 2008 and 2012. And when we looked just at the low gradient trips that had been treated compared to the low gradient trips that hadn't been treated, we saw a 29% increase in the mean residual depth, so flow independent depths in treated areas versus the non treated low gradient areas. Um, and we saw a huge increase in large wood volume in those treated areas. Water temperatures are still pretty high in a lot of places in the watershed, specifically in most of the main stem um, and in some of the tributaries as well, but canopy cover is improving. So back to our map here. So this is, again, the um, headwaters of the main stem moving downstream here on the main stem to the ocean. Um, you can see that the canopy conditions in the, in the major tributaries like Inman Creek and Signal Creek are great, North Fork great. Um, we have some problems still in areas uh, like Blue Water Hole, which is the south draining um, tributary, and then certainly in the main stem here um, through a lot of the, the watershed. Uh, generally speaking, you know, here's the numbers for the trips. Pretty good, not so great in the main stem. Um, we did see an increase in percent canopy cover midstream in the Garcia main stem during our sampling period, which is good news. Um, and so that's the, the kind of the measurement taken in the center of the stream. We also saw increases in the total riparian canopy and, and woody riparian canopy cover. I think a lot of that is probably related to the lack of catastrophic flows during this time frame. So we've got a lot of um, alders and other deciduous uh, trees growing in here. So water temperatures, um, we're looking at the MWMT or max weekly maximum temperature here, uh, exceed numeric targets that have been set for optimal rearing for coho in the main stem. Um, a, a number of the TRIBs actually meet that target. So uh, TRIBs like the North Fork Garcia and Signal Creek, um, Graphite Creek and Olson Gulch, um, three of the four of those have coho, incidentally. Um, and then if you look at just the temperature threshold set for the presence of, of salmonids, uh, of coho salmon, again, we're exceeding in the main stem, um, but meeting in a lot of the trips. So uh, the tributaries, if you look at the bug situation, the, the, according to the bugs, the tribs are a pretty good place to be. Um, and salmon and trout are found in, in all subwatersheds at this point, but in pretty small numbers. So we, if we look at the California Stream Conditions Index data for our sites, the low gradient tributaries and the high gradient tributaries meet numeric targets um, for CSCI. So they all are likely intact uh, on average. And the main stem um, did not meet the ideal numeric targets for CSCI and fell in the, in the upper end of the likely altered range on average. Um, we didn't see significant changes in CSCI scores between our sampling periods. 
this is just to give you kind of a, a sense of the distribution. And again, you can see that uh, for the most part, things are looking really good for bugs in the tribs. Um, there's some areas like this where where flow um, is very limited, and, and so the bugs are not super happy. But then you can see down here, especially in the main stem here, um, we're getting bug scores that are that are lower than we'd ideally like to see. We collected, uh, we calculated a, a bunch of different um, other BMI metrics. This is just to give you a sense of what some of the other information looked like. Um, and these are scored uh, on a scale from 1 to 10 using the, the North Coast IBI metrics um, developed by Andy and colleagues. And you can see for EPT richness, um, the low gradient and high gradient tributaries are almost at the top of the range. Um, the main stem is, is more depressed, kind of, but just still above the midpoint. And for intolerant individuals, we're hovering right around the midpoint. Um, and for non-insect taxa, uh, towards the higher end of the range. Uh, Salmonids are, according to the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, who are um, doing population monitoring on the Mendocino Coast, um, they're spawning uh, widely throughout the watershed. We also do snorkel surveys associated uh, with our EMAP sites. Um, and so we found them to be rearing also widely in the watershed, though in relatively small numbers. Um, coho are maintaining all three cohorts. Uh, steelhead are widely distributed throughout the watershed, and Chinook are showing up occasionally um, as our pink salmon. I'm going to pass it back to Jonathan to wrap up. Thanks, Jen. Um, so, in conclusion, uh, as Jennifer was mentioning, main stem um, still has and needs more time to recover. There's excess sediment um, that's still being vacated. It just kind of makes sense in general. Um, it's very low gradient. Um, it's kind of the depositional zone for the system. You'd expect the tributaries to improve first, so we're on a continuum in the right direction, um, but more time is necessary. Um, as far as the tributaries go, uh, they appear to be improving or they're already currently meeting targets. Um, as Jennifer already pointed out, there's a, b a bunch of different variables that we looked at that um, are looking pretty decent. Um, so that's good, good news. We're, we're glad to see it on that trajectory. A couple of the lessons learned, um, uh, like I mentioned, uh, the impairment took a really long time to occur. Um, you know, we looked at a over 100 years of history um, and similarly to actually recover is going to take a long time. Non-point source is it's a different beast than turning you know, a valve on a pipe um, that shuts off some sort of pollutant. You need, um, you need the, the watershed to um, help facilitate that obviously and uh, that, that is really the primary driver of recovery is just normal watershed annual flows, um, trees growing back in, stru structure being replaced. Um, but we do believe that the conservation and restoration actions are helping to facilitate that and increase that. Um, the implementation of the TMDL we consider to be a success and attribute a lot of that to these strong partnerships. We, you can't do something like this on your own. The Water Board can't just step up and say, here is our new laws and we expect everybody to step up and just, it, it really takes a community of participants. Um, we work closely with environmental nonprofit organizations like TNC, the Conservation Fund. We work with local RCD, Resource Conservation District, NRCS, um, Department of Fish and Wildlife is huge in this, um, NOAA, National Marine Fisheries Service. But most important is these landowners that are, um, you know, controlling and being the stewards for this land. So um, they are our key partners in this. Um, also on that note, the investment to date is probably around, um, we're guessing around seven and a half to ten million dollars um, in erosion control work. Um, to quite a bit over the, over this period. A lot of that is uh, public funds. Um, you need you need to um, help facilitate this through um, both uh, private and public investments. And the uh, TMDL to succeed, it, it has to be a, a catalyst for some type of action, but it also, like I said, needs to be um, it, it needs to provide a support um, infrastructure to get things done. 
believe that a, a actual recovery strategy for a watershed requires several different components besides just pollution control and repairing productions are key to that, but also doing habitat restoration. Um, and we think that the, the Garcia River Monitoring Program um, is a good example of a robust tracking tool to um, see um, whether we are headed in that right direction. And uh, we think it's a, a essentially a... Um, it allows us to evaluate whether those actions are, are working um, and therefore it's a surrogate for other uh, watershed recovery strategies. The North Coast region is um, over 60% of it is similarly impaired for sediment and temperature like the Garcia. So we don't believe that we'll be able to replicate this same type of a program at this scale unless we have other really um, key partnerships like the ones we have. Um, so we think that this is a, a great um, you know, indication that you can do these types of conservation and restoration actions. You can help facilitate improvement in watershed, and um, we're, we're starting to see the results of that. So with that, um, thank you all. Appreciate it. As part of your restoration, have you uh, looked into or, or done any uh, tree planting along the main stem to help support uh, the temperature decrease and holding in the sediment? Um, there has been, um, on a couple of the tributaries, there's been some uh, riparian planting that was done years ago. Um, but, but there's also uh, areas where a lot of bioengineering on the main stem was, was implemented. Primarily, we're looking at just natural forest recovery and um, growth as that uh, being the, the primary mechanism for recovery of the temperature impairment. Um, it just takes time. You know, we can we can't really force the trees to grow any faster than they are. And so we're 50, 60, 70 year old trees that are just starting to provide a lot of benefits for temperature. Um, that's a good question. Yeah, I would also just to follow up on that, um, has there been any temperature modeling in the basin so that you have some understanding of what the sub-basin um, differences are in potential temperature recovery because you shouldn't expect the same temperature everywhere. Yeah, yeah so... Um, Would you turn on the mic, please? Can you turn on this mic, please? It's on. Okay, great. Yes, we have. Um, so we worked with Stillwater Sciences in implementing their basin temp model in the watershed, uh, and that's provided a lot of great information that, that's helping in, to inform what to expect where. Also, I would, I would just add on the, the last question about um, trees and, and canopy cover. The main stem is uh, obviously a much um, wider and bigger system, and so we're not going to, you know, we're not, the, the goals that were set in the CMDL are not the same for canopy closure for those areas as they are for the tributaries, and we're not going to get up to 90 or 95 percent canopy closure in the main stem ever. I mean, it probably never was even close to that. Um, but uh, there, yeah, so, yes, we do have, have that model. How do you establish that the river is temperature impaired? How do you establish that the river is temperature impaired? How are you going to uh, look at this impairment in the context of climate change and the water is possibly changing over time for temperatures? Yeah. One, yeah. Um, so the, uh, in the late 90s, there was information provided that uh, supported the listing for temperature in the basin. Um, I don't have... I don't have a real sense of where the sources of that information came from, it's, uh, but the ongoing uh, hobo temp data that we've been using and the, um, the targets that we've established for the Garcia clearly indicate that it exceeds what's the ideal conditions for rearing um, of, of juvenile salmonids. And as far as climate change, we'll talk about. Yeah, so I'd say, um, so we, we have 
about 25 locations where we have uh, hobo probes that are placed every year during the critical summer months, usually from June through the end of October. They're tracking water temperatures. Um, so we're able to look at, um, we're going to be able to look at changes over time, uh, potentially. And I'd say that the, the biggest um, way that we're looking at kind of mitigating potential impacts associated with climate change um, is to protect cold water resources and restore riparian processes. So allow riparian forests to progress um, in their natural state to provide canopy and to provide in-stream complexity that can help deepen, um, deepen areas of the stream and, and maintain and provide provide cold water resources for long periods of time. Okay, this, uh